domain. Uh, 40,000 foreign fighters from 110 countries around the world were pouring into uh, Syria from the 2013 to 2016 time frame. And it was uh, committing acts of genocide, planning and plotting major attacks against our homelands, it attacks in Brussels and Paris, all planned in Raqqa. Literally, terrorist combat teams would infiltrate out and carry out those attacks uh, in the streets of Europe. So that's where we were. So we, we put together a global coalition and worked with partners on the ground with the first, uh, the first goal uh, to defeat what was the physical caliphate of ISIS, the real physical uh, manifestation and how they can control territory. And we're down now uh, to about the last 1% of that. So I think that's been a significant achievement. I think over a period of months or so, uh, those operations should conclude. And that will be the defeat of the physical caliphate. Now, when uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared himself the caliph, he's talking about uh, cities and territory and millions of people under his domain as the caliph. It's hard to proclaim yourself as a caliph if you don't uh, really control the speck of territory. So that will be a significant blow to the organization, a significant achievement for our coalition. Uh, but it is not uh, the end of ISIS. We have to keep pressure on their clandestine networks and cells in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we have to work as global partners, truly globally, and uh, we work through the UN on this with UN Security Council resolutions starting with 2178 and 2014 and 2396, really mandating all countries to follow and track who is getting on and off airplanes. Uh, we've built a database of about 40,000 people. We think the propaganda really 24-7 in cyberspace. So. Those are the types of things that will be ongoing for really a period of years. But in terms of what, what made ISIS this global phenomenon uh, and its physical manifestation in Iraq and Syria, we're very close to, uh, to finishing that job. Last night, President Trump spoke to President Erdogan of Turkey, um, basically, I think, trying to persuade him not to mount some big Uh, that have been fighting ISIS that are supported by the United States. Um, I mean, the big Turkish offensive against the Kurdish forces of the Syrian Democratic. So I won't characterize the call. It was a very substantive call. I think it was a very productive call and a very constructive call. Um, we are very focused, as I just mentioned, on uh, completing uh, the mission uh, by which we sent Americans into Syria, completing the mission of uh, defeating the physical manifestation of ISIS, particularly in what we call the Middle Euphrates Valley. So uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces we worked with actually just entered a major town called Hajin uh, just uh, three days ago, and they are now moving through uh, that town, a very significant, um, significant development on the battlefield and a positive one. We want to sustain that momentum and complete the campaign. Um, at the same time, we're working closely uh, with Turkey to uh, listen to and to address concerns they might have on the border. And as uh, my colleague, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, has said, we uh, have a solemn responsibility to ensure that the security of our NATO ally is, is protected. Um, we want to work this out diplomatically. Um, uh, we've said from Washington a, a military operation we don't think would be uh, wise or acceptable. Um, so I'll let Washington speak for that. I think they had a very clear statement. Uh, but since then, the conversation uh, between our two presidents was constructive, and I'm, I'm confident that, that we can work this out. And our main focus here in Syria is uh, completing the, the counter-ISIS campaign. We have to complete that campaign here over the coming uh, months. Under Secretary Voronkov, do you have a view on a possible Turkish major operation against the Kurds in Syria? You know, the mandate of my office is very clear. It is based on the global counter-terrorism strategy approved in 2006. We have updated option of this uh, strategy from this year. And uh, one of the three to terrorism, second one, prevent and combat terrorism, third one, capacity building activities in support of the member states, last but not least, ensuring the rule of law and human rights in counter-terrorism aspect. So I think uh, this is uh, very important for understanding of our role. We in support of member states on request of member states, and this is our task. So this question is little bit not with, in line with my mandate.
Thank you. How many ISIS fighters are left for either of you, or both of you? How many ISIS fighters are left in Iraq and Syria you know, in terms of estimates? And how many ISIS fighters are, uh, exist globally um, you know, in places like Afghanistan or Libya? So if you allow me, I will start. According to different data, uh, it's going on about 20,000 people at this very moment in different parts of the world, including Syria and Iraq. And of course, this is a significant number. And uh, the task of my office is again to utmost in order to support the countries with a huge risk of the appearance of new terrorist threat. Uh, in order to, to, to help them to be prepared to this very scourge. Mr. McGuck? I think we get this question a lot. I try to stay away from the numbers and you look at the, you really look at their capabilities. So um, in 2014, they were, again, quasi-state with 8 million people under their domain with revenues of a billion dollars a year. Uh, that has now basically uh, collapsed. Uh, they are able to mass a maneuver force around a battlefield like a sophisticated army. Uh, they can no longer they can no longer do that. Uh, they had very sophisticated terrorists like uh, Muhammad Ad Adnani planning and plotting the major foreign attacks. Um, all those people are dead. The people who planned the attacks in Paris, for example, all of them have either been captured or been removed uh, from the battlefield. So, um, in terms of their Now I want to make sure that they cannot get out. Um, Sorry, so it's a couple of thousand, just to clarify, where are those couple of thousand? That is in a, in a portion of what remains of their physical uh, space, right kind of southeast on the Euphrates River, around the town of Hajin, which I, which I had mentioned. Um, so they won't be around for much longer, I think I can guarantee that. Um, so it's a significantly de degraded organization. But again, nobody who does this day to day is naive enough to know that uh, you can just declare victory and walk away. We have to maintain pressure on these networks um, for really a period of years. There seems to be um, the United States was in Syria to defeat ISIS. Now the, the new position is to remain there until every military force uh, of the Iranians uh, departs. I mean, which could be tomorrow or it could be forever. I mean, it's not clear. Is that sort of a mission creep or is that, I mean, how do you square these two goals? I think so the military mission in Syria for why we have uh, U.S. forces on the ground, the military mission is the defeat of ISIS and full stop. There's no other military mission. The military mission is the defeat of ISIS in Syria. And we speak about the enduring defeat, recognizing you can't just again pull up stakes because you have to follow through and ensure that uh, you're able to maintain pressure on class clandestine networks and the ground can hold. So we have a number of diplomats on the ground who work with our military partners uh, in Syria, working on stabilization. I've been to Raqqa four times. Uh, the first time I went to Raqqa, the devastation uh, was truly extraordinary. It's hard to see how anybody would come back to their homes. Uh, we deployed a team of diplomats to work with Syrians, training them to clear landmines, to clear rubble. And we now have 150,000 Syrians have returned to their homes in Raqqa. Still a very difficult situation, but that's the type of, that's the type of work that our people on the ground are doing. It is all geared towards uh, the counter-ISIS campaign. We, of course, have other objectives in Syria uh, beyond our military campaign, which you mentioned, Peter, um, which also we, we want to we see. But the, the military... ...problems in the Middle East and, to some extent, Europe. Um, sectarianism, obviously, and the failing governments in a lot of Arab countries. Uh, I mean, are you concerned about a son of ISIS or a grandson of ISIS, uh, given the fact that so many of these underlying conditions continue to exist? I think it's a very important question. We need to think about the integration uh, of a number of people from involved in these terrorism activities before, but after rehabilitation process. And these two processes are very difficult, but very important in order to achieve the final goal to exclude terrorism from the international agenda. For example, there is a huge number of children born during this ISIS period of time. This 
children have no registration, no nationality, uh, and uh, there is no one country eager to deal with this issue. So one of the topics which is very high in the agenda of the United Nations to create the necessary framework. My office is preparing a handbook on best practices in this field. So I think it's very important to show that there is a way forward for these people. Of course, guilty should be sentenced, but not non-guilty should be, should be integrated back to the activities, to, to the normal activities. I was in Iraq last this year visiting philology area, and one of the big problems for this area is to how to accommodate these people back because neighbors wouldn't like to have these people back. And this is a huge task for the international community to find an appropriate answer on this very question. And, and sort of a follow-up to that, but in, in addition, Mr. McCurk, um, you know, uh, uh, the Undersecretary mentioned the, you know, these, no one wants a lot of these ISIS fighters back or their families, and a lot of them are living in Syria uh, under Kurdish, in Kurdish custody. Uh, what is the plan to repatriate the hundreds of foreign fighters, to reintegrate children who may have been born uh, in the caliphate, uh, how do you deal with this problem that no one wants, wants, seems to really want to deal with? Well, so we have about 700 uh, foreign fighters, foreign terrorist fighters, who are now in custody in Syria. Um, they're from uh, dozens of countries. They are housed in a facility that we believe meets uh, international standards. The ICRC and others have had access to that facility. We're very committed to that. Um, at the same time, there's a very difficult issue. There's uh, legal problems for getting them out and getting them repatriated. There's all sorts of other uh, things. So we are literally working country to country uh, to try to come up with uh, a program to repatriate these people to their homes for prosecution uh, under their host nation laws. Uh, we have made some progress with some countries and, um, and it's something that continues. But until uh, that is resolved, uh, in some sort of final status. We want to make sure that they are housed. They cannot get out. Uh, they cannot intermingle, so we don't have some of the, the mistakes that might have been repeated a decade or so ago. Um, and that's what we're really focused on, on on the ground as Syria as we work through this. Two of those prisoners are the alleged murderers of um, Tim Foley, the American journalist, and they're, Brit they're British citizens. Their citizenship have been revoked. The British don't want them back. They're sort of, uh, it's a reply, I mean, We'll see a day in an American uh, earlier uh, in the day. Um, one of the rationales for the blockade, supposed rationales, was that Qatar has uh, you know, been financing terrorism or hasn't had strict enough laws. Do you? Th I mean, can you give us your opinion as a UN, the senior UN official on this subject? Uh, about kind of what Qatar has done to uh, improve, or was that a, a real criticism anyway? Was that just sort of uh, not, well, not true in the first place? Thank you again for this question. Uh, my office is working uh, in a neutral manner. Uh, we need to involve all the countries because the, this is a global scorch terrorism, and nobody should is immune and nobody should be excluded. So we're working very close with the Qataris colleagues on countering of terrorism and prevention of violent extremists. We did agree about the next uh, directions of our common activities. First of all, coordination and enhancing international cooperation. And the colleagues are very supportive in this regard. Well, just to follow up, how do you assess what the Qataris are doing? Are they doing a good job? With regard to cooperation with my office, for sure, very good job. Uh, the next uh, field of activities is aviation security. It's a topical issue for the next period of time. And uh, engagement of all the countries and implementation of very well-known resolution 2396 about better environment, uh, security environment in airports if, is utmost important. The next topic we are working together is victims of terrorism.
support of victims of terrorism. It's a very important issue from humanitarian, human rights, human rights point of view. Uh, the, next, the next one is prevention of violent extremism. We are speaking about building up resilient society. So we have a global program to be implemented in the next years on prevention. And again, uh, our colleagues from Qatar are very supportive to this kind of activities. So all these activities is in line with global counter-terrorist strategy. And uh, this is my answer. For you, Mr. B Mr. McGurk, is, is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi alive? Does it matter? Is there a succession plan? So there have been times we have thought uh, he was no longer with us because we thought um, we had him in some areas of some fairly uh, devastating airstrikes. Um, we have captured people very close to him. Uh, he has gone back into deep hiding, it seems. If he is still with us, it's never really clear. Uh, there's other times he would then pop up with an audio tape. He doesn't show his face anymore. Um, uh, he sometimes comes out with an audio tape. So uh, we asked the question to the extent that it matters. Obviously, we want to do all we can to eliminate him, um, and we're working very hard at that. Um, he is not in command of his forces or his organization uh, because he is so far in uh, deep hiding. We do not see the extent of communications and things we had uh, even a year or so ago. So it matters because he's symbolic. He is someone that declared himself uh, the so-called caliph. Uh, he's a ruthless terrorist who's responsible for terrible crimes. Um, I have been to some of the actual the homes in eastern Syria where he was holding uh, slaves and all sorts of terrible things. So this is someone that we would uh, very much hope to remove from the face of the earth, and I think we're, we're very hot on his trail. And a succession plan? You know, as an organization, as they, as they really came under pressure, they, um, they had the philosophy of delegation, so they just delegated all of their um, uh, organization with affiliates around the world. Uh, they delegated uh, attack planning around the world. They delegated various elements of their military operations. Um, so it became a fairly diffuse organization. Um, so I think they probably have their secession plans in place, but a lot of the people who were in the line of secession also have been killed. So in terms of the leadership of this network, it has really been, uh, been decimated. Um, but it's also not an organization I would ever underestimate. But um, I, I am confident Baghdadi will not be with us for too much longer. For both of you, have social media companies done enough to reduce the kind of ISIS propaganda um, so we've worked very closely as a coalition with uh, the private sector and with Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. And this is also, again, I, I've made the reference to where we were four years ago till now. I think it is a good marker. And you've really seen a sea change. So um, Twitter, just for one example, if there is ISIS propaganda on Twitter, uh, it is taken down almost immediately. If you see it and report it, uh, and I do this because I'm on Twitter quite a bit, and if I see something, report it, they take it down almost immediately. Uh, YouTube uh, has algorithms to basically pick things up before even human eyes can see them uh, to take them down. So uh, there has been a concerted effort from, from the private sector, uh, which has been very good. And then we have worked uh, here in the region and around the world to have 24-7 really counter-messaging centers that are uh, not just taking down the content, but then putting out a very different message. So um, I think this has started to move in the right way uh, over the last few years, but this will also be one of those long-term elements even after we defeat uh, the, the physical uh, ca caliphate. I fully agree with, agree with this opinion. The situation with big companies is going well, and the extraction of these materials is very fast in the next two, three minutes, something like that. But it's going on about small and medium companies in this field. And the United Nations is trying to help these companies to be more effective in this regard, spreading this experience of big companies. So partnership with business in this field is very essential for the activities of the United Nations. And there is a project implemented together with other entities of the United Nations of my office a uh, uh, project which is implemented by my office with other entities on uh, spreading of these best practices from the big companies to the small companies.
For both of you, um, uh, two months ago in this very same hall that we're in, the uh, Qatari government and the UN had a conference on foreign fighters. Um, do, you, do you think the returning foreign fighters from ISIS, I mean, it, uh, it was obviously a real concern. Uh, were a lot of them killed in place? Uh, is, it, is it still a concern about what they could do when they return to their home countries? And how do you deal with it? You know, there are a number of examples when these people are back to their own countries and still creating a very big threat for the security and for the people of these countries. So it's a serious threat. It's a huge number of people. We need to remember that. of foreign terrorist fighters to give uh, countries chance to be more aware of what's going on with this. Um, Mr. McGurk, you, um, you've had your role both under President Obama and President Trump. Is there any way of a lot of these things, obviously, that, that we've seen the defeat of ISIS geographically, how much of that took place under President Obama and how much under President Trump? And was there a change in kind of tactics or strategy between the two? I think it's, it's uh, be careful here. It was, it's hard to compare and contrast. So I was in Iraq when Mosul fell, for example, and um, we had a pretty vigorous debate about the extent to which we had to respond. what was really a new Iraqi government and we could support them because at the time um, there was almost no ground force that we could work with. The Iraqi security forces had pretty much disintegrated and, and in Syria um, there was almost nobody to work with in this. So uh, it was an extremely daunting uh, endeavor. So we put together the campaign plan over the summer and fall of 2014 uh, and then gradually began, uh, began uh, pushing back. So uh, by the time President Trump took office, I think about 50% of the physical space, which we wanted to clear, had been done. Um, we actually had a very good transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. Um, we had a lot of very detailed meetings with the transition team. Um, President Trump made clear on his first day his priority was the defeat of ISIS. And he wanted to accelerate the campaign wherever he could. Uh, we did have a number of issues that were teed up in terms of decisions that could be made uh, to help do just that. Those decisions were made very quickly um, in the, by President Trump, and we did see an acceleration of the campaign. So, and I think now we're, we're literally down to the 1%. But just for example, Raqqa, uh, when President Trump entered uh, office, Raqqa was fully under control of ISIS. Um, it was the headquarters of ISIS. It was still their location where they were planning and plotting major attacks against, uh, against all of us, but also including the United States. That. And there were some very difficult questions uh, presented to President Trump early on, uh, which President Obama had actually passed off to the new administration. So uh, we did that pretty quickly. We put together a comprehensive uh, strategic plan together with Secretary Mattis and uh, Secretary Tillerson at the time, which the president endorsed. And the campaign really dramatically accelerated. I was in Syria uh, in the spring of 2017, working with some of our people on the ground and our military commanders and the extent to which we were moving faster, taking advantage of opportunities as they opened. Um, uh, we were really able to uh, to seize some opportunities that uh, I think serve the campaign quite well. In the 90 seconds we have left, uh, to end on a sort of optimistic note, uh, you spent a decade and a half working on Iraq. You were just in Fallujah. We've got a new Iraqi government. The uh, concrete barriers are coming down in the green zone. I mean, are the, what are the lessons learned here? Uh, and what is, the, what is the outlook for Iraq going forward? I'll be heading out to Iraq uh, tomorrow. There is a, first, I think uh, it is worth commenting on the sacrifices of the Iraqis in this overall fight against ISIS, um, the extent to which they mobilized their society, 
uh, and pushed back against this organization and did so in a way that put protection of, of civilians at the forefront of their military campaign, worked very closely with them on that. And thousands of Iraqi security force members. This year. And through the summer, they worked through their constitutional process and come up with a new government, get a peaceful transition of power. And uh, we feel very good about this new government. Um, new President Barham Saleh uh, just made a tour of the region, the new uh, Prime Minister. Adel Abdelmeti is obviously someone that we've known for some time, someone that many in this room have known for some time. And across the board, uh, they have very competent leaders in the new government. The campaign to making sure you maintain pressure on clandestine cells, protect their populations, protecting borders, helping to revive their economy. Uh, we feel very good about the overall direction of the new Iraqi government. So I think it is a real opportunity and a bright spot right now, uh, but it requires the, uh, the support and cooperation from so many in this region. I, I, I just met with some of the leaders here from Qatar this morning. I think we, we see that across the board. So I think it's an opportunity. We, one, one quick final word and then we'll wrap it up because we're running out of time. Now, very briefly, when I was in Iraq, I was really very impressed by the very strong will of the Iraqi people to overcome this dramatic period in their history. So, people for their own country is enormous, and I think this is the main successful in overcoming of all the difficulties appeared. We are trying to support, to assist, to help this country to overcome the difficulties. We are implementing four projects. Most of these projects are connected with education, with creation of decent jobs, and overcoming of the legacy of the previous dramatic history of this country. Join me in a uh, round of applause for uh, Brett McGurk and Under Secretary Voronkov. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you.